So we are in the last week of our I Love My Church series, and we've been learning that the pace of our lives and the priority of our lives are all focused around Sunday, right? And I know there's a couple of girls that try to get their dad to say, see, Dad, you're supposed to give us a break on Sunday, and they said, we'll make it a family project to clean the hot bar together, so. But they're still trying. I'm still working on them back there, girls. <laughs> That's Dave Warner laughing at them back there. Um, not that I like to drop names, but so, <laughs> so we're learning that God actually designed Sunday to be a day of rest. Refueling and refocus every, every seven days. This morning I want to show you how Sunday has changed the world. We've learned a lot about Sundays. I want you to hear how Sunday has changed the world because it affects your life directly. There is a gigantic amount of good that is being done by people who call Sunday the Sabbath. And they've done a lot of good over the last 2,000 years. Are you ready for this? Throughout our series, we've been reading the words of the prophet Isaiah, who promised, he said that if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's day holy, the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and doing as you please, or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you, he says, to ride in triumph on the heights of the land, Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. To ride in triumph. Is it really possible to ride in triumph on the heights? I want to talk to you about how to do that now. I want to talk to you about that and how the benefits from it all affect our eternity and affect the eternity for a lot of other people too. So turn to your Bible in Matthew 16, and verse 13, and put a bookmark there, or open your iPhone, or however, your Bible app, and, and just mark uh, Matthew 16 for a minute. And while you're turning there, I want to make a statement. I want to tell you something this morning. I believe that the Church of Jesus Christ, God's Sunday people, have done more good for this world than any other group in history. Than any other group, that's right. God's Sunday people have done more. And I think that I can back that up today. Let's pray and then let's get started. Father in heaven, we have come here today to hear a word from you. So we ask that you please speak to us in this time. We are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I have always been impressed by people who could look into the future and have some kind of shaping or effect on the world in a positive way. People like, you may have heard of Charlemagne. He decided that every child in his empire, in his empire, should be able to read. So he created the first public education system. Or in our own country, people like Patrick Henry, who started a revolution by declaring that liberty was more precious to him than life itself. Or Abraham Lincoln, who led the United States through the Civil War and ended the tyranny of slavery. Fifty years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. was able to envision a day when people would be judged, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And the Civil Rights Movement was born. These people were all Christians, Sunday people, all of them. The ability to imagine a better future and help create it as a gift, that's what it is. And when those people use it, they give a great gift to other people. History is filled with such people. But in my humble opinion, the greatest foreseer and shaper of the future was a carpenter from Nazareth named Jesus. No one has given the world a greater gift than Jesus. How did that happen? In the closing days of his life on earth, Jesus stood beneath a great rock in 
in Caesarea Philippi. And he boldly announced that he would build his church and nothing and no one would keep him from it. I want to read to you his exact words in Matthew 16. Okay? Matthew 16, 13 through 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now just imagine that you were standing in a, a bush nearby, or behind a bush nearby, and heard that, and overheard those words. You'd have been tempted to think this guy, Jesus, was delusional. He's speaking to 12 scared, confused men in an out-of-the-way place, in a backwater nation, under the oppressive thumb of the Roman Empire. How could one rabbi with 12 average guys establish this great philanthropy and this great organization to the world? How could he do that? And then add to it the handicap that this rabbi was going to die a horrible death at the hands of the Romans just a few months later. And the odds were well south of impossible that he was going to do what he said. And yet, and yet today, it's true. The Church of Jesus Christ has improved our world more than any other entity on earth. The story of Jesus and his church, it's an underdog story. Jesus is about to overcome the world with both hands tied behind his back. Everything is against him. Jesus rose on a Sunday. So, so his followers started gathering for worship and refreshment every Sunday. Hal Seed is the author of the book, I Love Sundays, and he calls the followers of Jesus Sunday people. You know their history, but listen for a minute as if you've never heard it. Jesus taught his followers to love their neighbors as themselves. So in Acts 2, during the first few weeks after the church is born, the Bible says that all believers were gathered together and they had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Jesus continually taught his followers to care for the hungry and the thirsty. So in Acts 4, the Bible says, there were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as they had need. Can you imagine? No wonder so many people were attracted to these Sunday people. No wonder. As Jesus' Sunday people started to spread, they spread over the part, all the world, from Israel to Syria, and they started another church in Antioch. Listen to the description of what Antioch was like before Christians arrived. Listen, this is, uh, it was a city filled with misery, danger, fear, despair, and hatred. A city where the average family lived a squalid life in filthy and cramped quarters, where at least half of the children died at birth or during infancy, 
and where most of the children who lived lost at least one parent before reaching maturity. A city filled with hatred and fear, rooted in intense ethnic antagonism. I'm quoting from historian Rodney Stark's book, A City Filled with Hatred and uh, the Rise of Christianity. Um, now listen to Stark's description of what happened when Sunday people showed up there in Antioch. Listen. Once Christianity did appear, its superior capacity for meeting these chronic problems soon became evident and played a major role in its ultimate triumph. That type of story has repeated itself year after year in every country and every place where Jesus' people dwell. That's a fact. In A.D. 362, Emperor Julian was bothered because so many people were converting to Christianity because of the loving actions of Christians. So he launched a campaign to create pagan charities in an effort to match the Sunday people. He went out and started competing by giving and helping others and doing that thing. And guess what? His efforts failed miserably. What would motivate people to risk their lives for the sake of others anyway? Only Sunday people have the answer. Only Sunday people. Since the Sunday Jesus rose from the dead, since that Sunday, Christians have been giving out cups of cold water in the name of their Savior. That's what they do. On the Sunday, that Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead, he gathered with his disciples and reunited in that upper room. And after training them for 40 days, he ascended to heaven. Ten days later, after he had ascended, was Pentecost Sunday. And they gathered, and the Holy Spirit came down on Sunday people, and they were born. Sunday people were born. Sunday became the Lord's Day, Revelation 1.10. As Christians huddled together on Sundays, they grew in faith together. And then they went out and they served down and outers, up and outers, and everyone else in between. According to Dr. James Kennedy, the late Dr. James Kennedy, um, in his book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born, he says, Sunday people invented the modern hospital, the university, gave literacy and education to the masses, created free enterprise, representative government, and civil liberties. Sunday people were the ones who abolished slavery in England and the United States. They elevated the status of women and invented the very concepts of charity and benevolence. A majority of people groups on earth today had their languages codified by Christians who created their alphabets and then translated the Bible into their languages. The reason Russia has a Cyrillic alphabet is because Saint Cyril created it for them so that they could read the scriptures. That story has been repeated in languages and people groups all over this world. Take art history or music history. Take a class in that and you will find that many of the best and most famous pieces were painted or composed by Christians. We have been Jesus' hands and feet in transforming hurting people into helping people. Takers into givers. And we have seen countless souls that have been saved for eternity. I love Sundays in part because Sundays infect people who celebrate them. And then those people infect the world with good. That's how powerful Sundays can be. The story of God 
building his church is a David and Goliath story. A rabbi named Jesus, joined by 12 confused, scared guys, was then joined by hundreds, then thousands, then millions, and now billions. And we, we, God's Sunday people, have changed and are changing the world with intentional institutions and with random acts of kindness. We're changing the world. Think about that. History confirms that the Church of Jesus Christ has affected more positive change on our world than any other entity. It has done so because of the energized efforts of Sunday people. More than any other group, the church has changed the world. And more than every other group, together, the church has changed the world. There's a story of a church plant. His name is Francis Kamau. He felt called to plant a church in his hometown of Nairobi, Kenya. When choosing a site for the church, Kamau decided to locate it in one of the worst districts he could find. His church bought two blocks of land off of the main boulevard, and it was the home of a lot of bars and a lot of brothels. Within two years of Francis moving in, most of the bars and all of the brothels were closed because the people had been won to the Lord and had sought better, more wholesome professions. That's a true story. This is the story of the church. It's the story of the church. Whenever and wherever Sunday people go, God goes, and lives change, and hope abounds. Hope abounds. That's what Jesus had in mind. That's exactly what Jesus had in mind when he stood underneath, underneath that rock in Caesarea Philippi and announced, I will build my church. In his mind, Jesus saw his people reaching out with love and kindness to all other people, to help others. Jesus' vision, here's his vision, it's that people would gather on Sunday and that they would rest and be refreshed and refocused. And then they'd scatter on the weekdays and they would take his love into their neighborhoods and communities. That's it. Jesus, working through Sunday people, can change the attitude of the world. It really can. 2,000 years ago, Jesus announced that nothing was going to stop him from building his church, and nothing has. Today, the church of Jesus is 2.3 billion strong, and it's growing every day. Now, I know world history isn't quite over yet, but we know where it's headed, don't we? And there are two events to anticipate for people who love Sundays and live them out during the weekday. I want to show them to you before we close this series. So turn in your Bible toward the back to Revelation 19. Revelation 19 depicts a day in the future when Jesus will be married to his people in a great marriage supper of the Lamb. It's describing a great marriage supper of the Lamb. The Apostle John describes it this way. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and the loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. That's what it means. Then the angel said to me, write this. 
Blessed are those who are inv invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And then he added, these words are of God, these are the true words of God. These words are true, he says. Now listen, no Super Bowl had been played yet. So when God was looking for a way to describe the joy and excitement of the day when Christ would be joined again with his people, he described the greatest event that was available in the New Testament times. And that was a wedding feast. Because they did it up. It was important. It was big. The wedding of the supper, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb is going to be the greatest day in history. It's a real day. It's a real day. And it's coming. The Bible says we will be dressed that day in fine linen. And fine linen, I said, stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. How do you get fine linen to wear to that wedding? You do good deeds in the name of Jesus Christ. Friends, don't miss this. People get to heaven because of grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 will tell you that. In a first century wedding, the first act of a groom was to pay the bride price. Jesus paid that price on the cross of Calvary. Okay? Bride, you are paid for. You are paid for. Once the bride paid the price and the bride returns home to prepare for her wedding, she makes everything for her new home, including her wedding garments. If you are a Christ follower, your price into heaven has already been paid. Now, now is the time to create your clothes. You do that by doing righteous acts like Sunday people have always done. That's how you do it. Let me read you one more passage. Okay? It begins in Matthew 25, verse 14. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Most of you here know the story, the parable of the talents. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Read it when you go home. If you don't know it, ask me any questions. But this is such an important lesson, friends. Listen, and you know it's about the rich man who was going away on a trip. He gave three servants in each an amount of talents. One invested him, brought him back three times. One invested his, brought him back one time. The other buried his talents and didn't use them, right? And he was not happy about that. So the parable of the talents, we know what happened. It's an important lesson. In the sake of time, I want you to hear this, though. When your life is over, when your life is over, there will come a time when you are united with your master, when you will see Jesus face to face. And he will tell you what he thinks of your efforts and what he thinks of how much you put toward advancing his kingdom. According to this power, parable, those who do an outstanding job will hear, well done, and they will be given incredible <clears throat> rewards. Those who do well will hear, well done, and they will be given good rewards. And those who serve themselves instead of the king will hear, you wicked and lazy servant, I do not know you. More than anything I could receive, anything that I could receive in this world, more than anything, I want to hear that. I want to hear, well done from my bridegroom and Savior, Jesus. And I want each of you to hear those words too. I want us all to be dressed in fine linens. And I want us all to be present with the Lord with bags of gold. So I have three suggestions for you as we end this series and we leave here today. First of all, be the church.
for God's sake, be the church. Take your place beside Sunday people in every generation throughout history by finding someone in need and helping them or caring for somebody who is hurting, or by supporting a charity, or volunteering for one, or find some other way to be the church. Find a way. Take a tag off the tree, make a difference in a life. The major focus of this series has been to help us to refuel, to refresh, to refocus by building a rhythm around Sundays. But the outcome of Sundays ought to have an effect on the world we live in, don't you think? So some of you need to share the gospel, spread the word, come to church every Sunday, bring somebody with you. But along with coming to church, be the church. Fill out that card, why you love your church. Put it in there as you read today. Please. And then the third thing, come back next Sunday. Next Sunday we're going to be starting a brand new series called The Gift of Christmas. We're going to have some timely, relevant messages to help people prepare their hearts to receive the greatest gift of all. Greatest we could ever receive. We're going to hear about the gift of hope when fear is crushing in. Love that changes our hearts Joy that brings laughter and light and peace, even in the midst of pain. Let's make this season a season that celebrates the life-giving gift of Christmas and one that says, we love our church. I love you all. I love Jesus. I love my church. And I love Sundays. Repeat after me. I love my church. I love my church. I love Sundays. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for calling us to be Sunday people. Jesus, thank you for paying the price to make us your bride. Help us to live like Sunday people all week long and bring us back next week, next Sunday, to celebrate you and to refuel again for more of what you have in store for us in this life. We love you. We love Sundays. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.